I'd like to thank our miners who are joining us this afternoon um, to talk about making mining operations more environmentally friendly. So uh, I'd like to welcome to the stage Mitch Thomas, Chief Financial Officer at Blackstone Minerals, Mark Turner, <laughs> Chief Executive Officer at Greenvale Mining Limited, and John Welburn, Non-Executive Director and Chairman at Phoenix Resources. Okay, so um, these three miners were uh, selected by myself um, as, <laughs> as, as, you know, kind of standout companies um, that are doing something um, on the environmental front. So um, I thought we could kick off the panel with a short introduction by each of the panelists about who they are and their companies, um, just share a bit of background. Thanks, Sammy. I'll go first. John sure. Wellborn, as introduced. And I'm here representing Fenex Resources Limited, uh, where I'm the chairman. Fenex is a Western Australian-based iron ore producer. We're currently producing 1.3 million tonnes per annum of high-grade iron ore out of the Iron Ridge Iron Ore Mine, which is in the Midwest of Western Australia. It's 500 kilometres by road from the port of Geraldton, which itself is about 400 kilometres north of Perth. Uh, so unlike the large-scale miners in the Pilbara, we're operating in the Midwest, and we're unusual as a small-scale miner in that we control our infrastructure. We have a uh, haulage company, uh, and we own our own port facilities at the port of Geraldton. Uh, we burn about a million litres a month in producing a bit over 100,000 tonnes of uh, high-grade iron ore. Uh, and ESG has been a focus of that company. We raised $15 million about three years ago to build that mine. Uh, we started operations in late 2020 and we started producing and selling iron ore in February of 2021. This morning we announced that we've produced 2 million tonnes uh, and over that 19-month period since first production, we've paid back more than $50 million in dividends to the shareholders. So given that we raised $15 million, and have generated more than $100 million of profit and paid back 50. That's a good result for a uh, emerging junior uh, producer with a lot of plans to grow in the Midwest. In relation to ESG, uh, I'm also involved with a number of companies. My background, I'm a chartered accountant. I was an investment banker lending to mining companies. And uh, for five years, I was the managing director of Resolute Mining Limited, in which I built a number of uh, gold mines in Mali, Senegal, uh, Ghana, uh, involved in exploration in Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso, and various other African jurisdictions. Uh, currently, I'm the chairman of Apollo Minerals. We have an early stage zinc project in Gabon. Uh, and uh, I'm passionate about the subject of uh, ESG in mining. Hi, I'm Mark Turner. I'm Executive Director and CEO of Greenvale Mining. Um, Greenvale Mining are doing the Alpha Torbonite project, which will make Greenvale the only company within Australia producing bitumen. At the moment, all bitumen in Australia is imported from overseas. And part of that project, we looked at how we could be more carbon neutral. And from that, we looked at a number of different ways, the usual conventional solar farms, wind farms, um, hybrid gas power with solar. But what we came across was geothermal. Um, geothermal uh, around the world is tried and tested technology, um, particularly in our neighbours, New Zealand. It's very common there. It runs 24 hours a day. It's not reliant on the wind or the sun or battery storage. So the more we looked into it, the more looked that this is the, probably the way that we would like to go. And um, geothermal, as the more we looked as well, it shows that it really does stack up on its own as a very good business. So we've got quite passionate about it now, and we feel like we want to be Australia's leading geothermal organisation as well as being Australia's only bitumen producer. Um, my background is engineering. Um, I've spent the last 25 years project management, some of the biggest projects, a billion dollar projects around the world, Australia, and Middle East, Europe, and Asia. I even had the spell of um, living here for two years. I'm quite familiar with Singapore and glad to be back here. 
Okay, thanks very much, Mark, and good afternoon. I'm very happy to be here in Singapore. Uh, so my name is Mitchell Thomas, and I'm the Chief Financial Officer of Blackstone Minerals. And so, look, we have a number of projects, uh, but our, our flagship is a nickel sulphide uh, deposit and project in northern Vietnam. Uh, so we acquired the, the concession and existing infrastructure in 2019. Uh, but for a bit of history, the mine actually operated between 2013 and 2016. Uh, but for those familiar with the nickel industry, uh, prices plummeted for nickel to $9,000 a tonne in 2016. Uh, so since then, it was on care and maintenance. And so I guess what we're trying to deliver at the moment is uh, what we've been drilling. So we increase the resource to, at the moment, it stands at 485,000 tonnes of, of nickel sulphide in situ, which is you know, globally significant. And so on the back of that resource, uh, we're completing studies at the moment, currently DFS, to build a, an integrated flow sheet so where the previous owner exported concentrate, we want to produce uh, through nickel sulfate to precursor active material or PCAM that will go into to battery cathodes, uh, specifically for the EV market, and also working with a partner who's producing EVs in country. So very much aligned with the ESG story. And look, I just joined the company about four months ago, so still very fresh, but I guess one of the main things that appealed me to the company was that we had this very strong, I guess, ESG credentials. Uh, so we actually trademarked the term uh, green nickel. And to back that up, we just completed our life cycle analysis, uh, which showed that we will be one of the cleanest uh, flow sheets in the world for, for what we're looking to produce. Uh, so very exciting times for our company. Uh, not currently producing, but hoping to produce by 2025. Uh, as a bit of history for, for me as a professional, so look, I, prior to Blackstone, worked for Rio Tinto for 12 years, and my last role was the CFO of Battery Materials. Uh, so very much love this thematic, uh, love where this industry is going, uh, love the collaboration with companies like uh, those that these gentlemen represent. And so, yeah, so happy to be here and, and happy to take any questions. All right, great, thanks. And um, just as a reminder to the audience, we will be taking questions from you throughout. So if you do have a question, just put up your hand and let me know, and we will get a microphone over to you. So I thought we could get a little bit deeper into what each of you are doing in terms of decarbonizing um, your sites and maybe other examples of what you're seeing from other miners in the, in the industry. Yeah, I'm happy to go first. Um, what we did with the... Alpha Torbonite project was we, one of the things we wanted to look at was really the processing. So we mine the Torbonite and the kennel coal, which are oil shells, and then you heat them up, and from there you produce your oil product. It goes back into kind of like a crude oil, and from there it's a heavy crude that we can produce bitumen. But part of the process is from doing that, you produce a lot of gas of emissions, especially if you do the conventional way, which is usually doing pyrolysis, which means you heat it up to high temperatures very fast, and from that, a lot of gases are produced. So what we did was we consulted with a number of consultants to see if there was an alternative that was less emission-focused. So what we did was we looked at doing liquefaction. So liquefaction is a process where you mix your material with a carrier oil, it blends it, you add hydrogen to add the pressure, and then you only heat it up to a lower temperature, probably only going up maximum to about 450 degrees. During that process, we really cut down the amount of emissions that we were producing. Now, now that we've got this, we've reduced our emissions, what we wanted to do as an organization was be carbon neutral. And from that, that's where we really started to look in what else we, we, can do, we could do. So our mine sites are pretty remote. Um, uh, Alpha Tormite is in the township of Alpha, which is in central Queensland. For those that know central Queensland, it is very remote. There's nothing really there. So how are we going to power this site? So that, that's, that's the next phase we're looking at now is can we use some of the gases that are produced to filled it to power the site? Can we put solar in there? What can we do? Because geothermal isn't at our site of where we are. Geothermal is at a separate location. So what we want to do is try and look at what we can do to make the actual mine site more environmentally friendly as well by using more renewable energies there as well. And then we're going to try and look at as well around mine site vehicles. You know, can we pick up some electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles to again 
just trying to really cut down on our emissions as the world's moving forward. Um, Beachman has to be moved in containers that we have to be heated. At this stage, we're not seeing the technology out there that there's hydrogen fuel vehicles, but I think over the next five to 10 years, that's gonna come. So again, we wanna be looking at that now work with uh, those vehicle manufacturers to see if there's any opportunities to see if they can produce a hydrogen vehicle that we could use as well. But that, that's more for the future. But what we can do in the short time is look at our processing, looking at our mining, and really trying to cut down on our emissions and then with a the geothermal offset them. Sounds good. Uh, John, I'll jump in uh, before we, we hand over. But look, from our company perspective, and perhaps if I broke it down by, by scope, uh, so scope one being, I guess, what we control. So the direct emissions from, from our planned uh, operation. Uh, look, the, the main things that, that we're doing is that, I guess with flow sheet design and technology, uh, producing nickel is, is not new. Uh, but for us, it was about choosing the technology that would be the most sustainable choice moving forward. And so we're very lucky in that regard in that hydromet flow sheets have gained prominence in the last few years. So that's the technology that, that we're adopting. Uh, the second one, and this one's, you know, pretty, you know, keen thematic at the moment is that we really feel that coinciding with our development schedule, electric fleets uh, will gain, I guess, uh, broader adoption and the technology will improve to the extent that we could use it. Uh, especially for the underground component of what we're looking to achieve. And look, you hear news out of Chile and even in Australia about open open uh, pit haul trucks being electrified in the next few years. So very exciting space. Uh, the, the second one for us, so scope two, being the energy that you, you know, pull from a grid or, or from your own source. Uh, we're very fortunate in this regard in that with our project location being in northern Vietnam, there is an abundance of hydroelectricity and also very low cost uh, hydroelectricity. And so we don't think we'll even need a PPA to be able to access it. Um, perhaps we could even enter one if we, if we need to. But again, the fact that it's there and it's abundant really makes it easy because what we're looking to do is very energy intensive. I think the, the final thing I'll say is, and this doesn't actually help us in terms of reducing our emissions, but I just, I think helps the, the general business case from an environmental perspective about our project is that carbon sequestration is, is getting a lot of prominence. Uh, so we're doing studies at the moment in Canada in that some of our waste material could be used to essentially store carbon. So effectively that would be a byproduct. So very good for, for kind of your top line, for your revenue, uh, but also very good for the, the broader environment in that we're producing this material that can, I guess, abate carbon for others. Uh, so main things from my side. So asking an iron ore miner what he's doing for decarbonisation is a little bit like asking Father Christmas what he's doing to protect the lifeline of turkeys. Um, I mentioned earlier that we uh, use a bit more than a million litres of diesel a month uh, and that's obviously scope one. So, uh, I, uh, you know, to, to it, it's a challenging question to answer for someone who in my introduction said that I'm you know, passionate about ESG outcomes in mining. The reality is in Fenex that we are focused on shareholder returns uh, and uh, we do so and we operate in a, as a junior in the industry and in order to be efficient, we use the most obvious technologies available. Now, if you come to our site, you'll see on display on arrival a, a solar panel grid and... Traditionally, in our presentation, if we were looking for ESG, we'd talk about the fact that we've used solar power to, to uh, in preference to various other parts of our operation. Um, in reality, we are a scope one emitter in an industry that is directly connected to the steelmaking industry. So we produce a lot of carbon, both directly and indirectly. We're looking forward to producing less carbon and being part of uh, the decarbonisation process that's happening across the industry. But here at the one-to-one -one forum where we're looking to engage with investors, I think it's important to point out that from Phoenix's perspective, we don't see decarbonisation as the in the in driving decarbonisation in the broader steel industry as in the best interests of our shareholders. Uh, now, that's a direct and somewhat confrontational answer. To be more promotional, uh, we, we have an unusually high-grade ore body. It's, uh, in fact, the, the infill drilling we're doing at the moment is repeated 30-metre intercepts of 68% iron in a hematite ore body, which FE203 chemists will tell you is... is 
pretty much um, the maximum iron content in hematite is close to 69%. So we, we, we ship a 64% lump product and a 63% fines product. That does have a decarbonisation benefit to our customers. It means that they're not using a dirtier product uh, and that does flow through uh, into lower uh, quality, higher quality, uh, better emission outcomes in, in their uh, steel furnaces. Um, but that's really a good fortune by the fact that we have such a high-grade ore body. We continue to focus on that. In our haulage fleet, we're looking at ways that we can use uh, alternative fuels to diesel, and we'd like to be uh, an early adopter of uh, potentially hydrogen trucks. And But that's in keeping with our focus on better returns to shareholders. We want a lower cost outcome for our transport infrastructure. Uh, we'd love to participate in a broader industry focus to remove diesel from mining equipment, whether it's electric or otherwise. Uh, and we'll be, uh, you know, as I've shown previously in other companies I've run operating, we'd like to be at the front edge and we're willing to take risk in terms of adopting technology. Um, uh, and so the, the, the best answer to the question is what we're doing is try, it's looking around for lower cost opportunities that provide decarbonisation benefits both to ourselves and our customers. All right, great. Um, amongst the juniors, there is this view that, um, you know, transforming your operations um, can be too costly. Um, what's your view on this in terms of the, you know, making it, making it make sense uh, from a business perspective? Well, I think that, you know the projects in feasibility have a good opportunity to to really assess that conundrum, the capital opex trade off, um, and but I'd, I'd also turn the question around and pose it to the investors that are here because ultimately it's a bit like Obama talking to people about gun control in the U.S. and saying vote the ticket. Uh, you know, the, the uh, I look around at the, the the number of people we've attracted to the ESG panel uh, in an investor forum. Um, companies are going to adopt things that their investors want them to. Uh, predominantly, that's going to be lowest cost uh, in industries that are ultimately are responsible for carbon emissions. Um, uh, for juniors, though, I think there is going to be a great opportunity to take the risk to be an early adopter, to pick up on, on the theme of what we're doing at Phoenix. Uh, you know, when I ran Resolute, we built the world's first fully automated underground mine. I think that underground mining will continue to go electric. There are some real positives about that experience. It's also a huge learning experience. And it's allowed me to say what I'm saying for Phoenix is that, you know, to, to pick up specifically on the question, junior companies and even large mining companies can't change the OEM industry. You know, not even BHP or Rio can redesign the, the totally. They can give some influence over um, trucking equipment or, or locomotives or, or other aspects. Um, uh, so what we really want to do is participate and juniors, I think, collectively can drive changes in the industry and the adoption of electric underground equipment, for example, or lower carbon uh, operators. Yeah, I think John, you're choking a good point there. I mean, as a, you know, an explorer, you've got to make sure everything stacks up. You know, the business case has to be there. You can't just spend shareholder money because you want to be a completely green organisation. And one of the things that we did um, was make sure that when we looked at Geothermal that it did stack up and it actually stood up as a standalone business. So it makes revenue. So it actually pays for itself. So not only do we get the revenue from selling power onto the grid. We also get carbon credits and we get renewable energy credits as well from the government. So they're on the market at the moment. They fluctuate. Um, at the moment, I think they're about $35 for every megawatt of electricity you produce. So if you're producing 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, that revenue soon stacks up as well. So you're not only producing... And those credits you can offset against your own projects, but you can also sell them on the open market as well. So it gives another form of revenue. So that's one of the attractive things to us is not only are we making our projects carbon neutral, but we're also providing extra revenue and opportunities to the business as well. 
you know, fair enough. I'm just think, kind of thinking about how I digest that. And, and maybe in, in slight contrast to John, well, look, I think in your position, I'd probably have the same mentality. It's, you know, what do the shareholders need? Because ultimately that's your, you know, your main stakeholder group that you're delivering against. But maybe for us with a different time horizon, so looking to produce by 2025, Again, I mentioned that we trademarked green nickel, so we don't really have a choice. You know, we have to really focus on achieving net zero and reducing the emissions that, that our project will deliver. Uh, one, one thing to mention, looks so I again, I'm the CFO, so very much a finance person. And I think that, look, it doesn't exist at the moment, but it will exist in the next few years. A strong business case for those that can show strong ESG credentials. And so while we're not seeing it in terms of dollars at the moment, in terms of the price that people pay for, for nickel, lithium, copper, et cetera, we think that market will present. And I guess as a, you know, a, a precursor to that is that we're seeing that customers are coming to us directly because they know that you know, we have strong ESG credentials, uh, carbon is obviously a, a big focal area. So while the business case at the moment may be challenged, I think in the next few years that will turn around and then hopefully reward our shareholders. Yep, sure. Do we have a microphone? So I guess you talk about credits, right? But what about the cost in the future? Do you all feature that in your feasibility studies on the potential cost of operations if governments do enforce some kind of cost in the carbon emissions? How, how, how do you think about that in the eventuality and you know understanding that mines last beyond up to 10 years and beyond look maybe I'll, I'll hold the mic there but you know for sure i mean there are jurisdictions in the world that do have a carbon trading scheme so if you operate in california or canada you are paying a, a carbon tax for the carbon that you emit so i mean that's a very clear-cut way for building a business case for saying to avoid that opex uh, let me convert that into capex in terms of building renewables um, so we definitely do uh, in vietnam there's no such, such scheme and we aim to be net zero, um, but if there were, we were to include that. We would include that. I was going to say, and um, for us, supposedly with Australia, uh, we've got to be carbon neutral. It's the future. It's where the, the business is, where the country is heading towards. So if you don't have any plans for that, then you're going to have to buy those carbon credits off of us, and they're very expensive. You know, you'd be talking millions of dollars a year that is, um, you're going to have to spend to buy those carbon credits from others who are producing them. And that's not a very good business case, in my opinion. I think as a business going forward, you've got to have something there that's going to be long-term. You need a long-term plan because it's only going to get harder and harder. Um, as an organisation, if you haven't got good ESG policies in place, you need to be looking forward to what's going to change, changes are going to come, and we all know that it's coming. I, 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 we don't have a view on uh, how we would be target uh, carbon neutral. Uh, you know, we're a very small part of a very big iron ore engine in Western Australia, and it's difficult to assess how there could possibly be uh, a West Australian. As state government, if if they uh, or if the federal government or the state government changed uh, the current regime on on iron ore production to um, mandate the sort of carbon payments that would require huge changes to the industry, so that's the the direct question. But the other way to look at that is we're already paying a carbon tax. I, I mentioned we use a million liters of diesel. Um, you know, the, the highest cost component of our operation is to move iron ore 500 kilometres by road from Iron Ridge to the port of Geraldton. If we can do, you know, and traditionally road transport of bulk commodities like iron ore is about 10 cents per tonne kilometre. On a railway, you can get it down to about two cents per tonne kilometre. Currently at Phoenix New Hall, our haulage fleet, we would claim to have the most efficient bulk haulage road network in the world, uh, and we've got that down to less than five cents a tonne kilometre, and I don't think that anyone who'd be able to claim that uh, over that sort of haul distances. We have an ambition to eclipse rail. We would only achieve that by removing diesel from, from that component. That means we need to find alternative powered trucks and flight them and use a whole lot of other technology, and, and we're trying to push that responsibility down onto Volvo and Mac, our prime mover partners, uh, as well as start the process of uh, 
we've already had, you know, a, a unique 140-ton, 65-metre quad trailer set licensed in Western Australia where people said we wouldn't, um, and we're now starting the process of trying to flight those so you effectively get six trucks uh, behind one where only the front truck has a driver in it. Um, this is mildly scary uh, concept for grey nomads towing their caravan along the Brand Highway, um, but we'll uh, we'll try and get there. So now that's a long way from uh, thinking about net, you know, car buying carbon credits or capturing carbon credits in our operation, but it's more immediate um, and uh, we'll obviously respond to legislation on carbon if it eventuates. But I think there's a much broader industry requirement to look at really efficient operations and I'm really inspired by you know the, the the collective opportunity to come up with more efficient uh, industries think about what I said about rail I mean I see rail is an 18th century choo-choo technology I mean it's it's still why is it the most efficient way to move bulk commodities across land you know I, I would challenge that we just haven't worked hard enough at creating better solutions and I agree with everyone else that those better solutions must be cleaner solutions um, all right. And what's the message that you're hearing from investors right now in terms of their requests upon you? Look, that, that's <laughs> a really interesting discussion. I, uh, uh, you know, I mentioned I, I um, worked at Resolute. It was an African-focused gold miner. When I joined that company in 2015, it needed a reset. And, uh, you know, I... Uh, led the company to join the World Gold Council and as a director of the World Gold Council I participated in the formulation of what is now known as the Responsible Gold Mining Principles. And I was inspired that Resolute was going to be rebranded around a, a, a responsible um, African-focused mining company focused on ESG credentials and empowering local em employment and changing the construct of expatriate labour in African iron ore miners. Uh, and I'm disappointed to say that I found very little traction with my investors. Uh, you know, if I could tell them, and I'm only exaggerating slightly, that we could save fifty dollars by pumping cyanide into the river, and no one's going to know. Uh, you know, a lot of them, um, particularly in North America, would have said, "Well, look, don't tell me about that." But you know, I, 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 that sounds pretty good. Um, so there, I think there's a mix. Clearly, you know, there's, you know, getting green into the title of your company is a, is a fantastic outcome. You know, I think if we took a poll of the presentations here, the colour green certainly uh, is front and centre. Uh, a lot, a lot more mining presentations than it's ever been. Um, and, and hopefully that's a good thing. And hopefully it's, a, as I said earlier, vote the ticket. Like if investors, if, if people at any level, if you're interested in a better future and, and better carbon outcomes, then buy companies that are doing things about it. Um, but, you know, particularly in the, I think investors are more interested in returns generally. Um, it's interesting to look, you know, certainly though, the positive signs, let's be more optimistic. Coal has come out of the listed space. It's still getting a lot of investment in the private landscape, but there's very few, you know, coal development, if any, in the listed space. Um, and that's a good sign in terms of where investors want to put their money behind green contentials. I think there's no space anymore for companies that aren't focused on the broader concept of ESG in terms of being a responsible miner. And that's not just around carbon, it's around employment practices and a whole lot of other things. And uh, the more investors can lead that behaviour, the better. On that note, um, Greenvale are changing their name to Greenvale Energy. <laughs> <laughs> so we feedback from our shareholders and the industry in general, um, the way things are going. We felt like changing our name to Greenvale Energy from Greenvale Mining was the right move. It was the direction that we were going. The Alpha Torbonite project is different. We've tried to do it as green as possible to say, even to say it's green bitumen to some extent. In, if you look at in Australia where all bitumen is imported from overseas, um, that has to be shipped in containers at around 200 degrees and the amount of emissions it gets as it travels around the world to get to Australia, just by us being able to produce it locally is also offsetting the loads of those emissions. So we feel like, um, as, a, as, as an organisation, that's the direction that we want to go. I have a lot of shareholders that ring me with concerns because we are an oil shale project as well. And oil shale projects in Australia are not easy to get approved. 
So you have to have a strong business case around carbon offsetting to get that through the local, to get that through the government. And um, we believe we've got that. And with the story of we're reducing the world's emissions by producing locally and then by producing by geothermal, again, it's a good story. So, But I'm quite surprised how many shareholders recently ring me and ask me and they want to know that we have got something in place, a plan in place for this. So it's going back to your original question, I do believe that shareholders nowadays are getting more conscious and want to know this. They want to make sure that your business is going to get approved and it's going to go forward. Hey, look, I, I do agree with the other panellists, but probably more sit in, in the John camp in that there are, are two classes of shareholder uh, or investor and, and the first class being the majority. Look, they, they care about ESG, but it's more of a tick box to say, look, do you have a plan? Is, is ESG on the horizon? And if that's met, then look, that's sufficient. They can move on. And that's the majority. Uh, the part that we're probably interacting more with are the ones that are, you know, these hardcore kind of green bonds, uh, energy, you know, trading organisations out of Europe. They're the ones that are really, I think, leading the charge in terms of ESG uh, investing. Uh, but unfortunately, at the moment, they're not the majority. Yeah. But I think we'll see that shift change over time. I think, look, we're talking about investors, so I don't want to get too off track. But I think where you may actually see the, the climate changing um, thematically in terms of investment is that customers seem to care a lot more about you know ESG than investors and so I think it's only a matter of time before investors kind of see that push and say look of course you know every miner wants a large long life low cost asset but I think that paradigm will shift in that ESG credentials will become part of that mix I don't know when it will happen uh, but hopefully soon so uh, I think the positive thing is, is that we are seeing a movement. Any questions from the audience uh, before we move on? All right, so we started to touch on this earlier. Um, so, you know, we've been talking quite a bit about managing your own emissions, um, but looking kind of down the value chain at, at scope three emissions, how do miners um, take those into account and, and deal with that, um, I guess, in terms of communication and, and all of that? Well, look, unfortunately, I'm falling into a theme here, but I think you have to force us to, is the end result. You know, I, I, it, it's it's an incredibly complex issue to, to talk about scope two emissions, let alone further down the track. Um, uh, so, and particularly at the junior investment end, uh, I think if we're creating cleaner products and we're part of a value chain, that, that's what we can do. But the reality is in terms of even having the capacity to understand the, the very complex scope two, scope three emissions for an early stage miner, that's, uh, that's really a job, I think, for the regulator uh, and or the market uh, rather than the junior company. Um, but to pick up on the theme, I mean, uh, you, there are, it's not just the investors, there is the regulators and other aspects. An interesting case study would be what's the changing business practices of the Perth Mint. I'm, I'm pretty confident that's Australia's largest gold refiner still and has previously had a monopoly. Uh, there's been all sorts of press recently about their involvement with uh, a, a blood time and type artisanal gold production in Papua New Guinea as a state owned. Uh, refiner, uh, and and that's although it's very different, it's a it's just a sign that what used to be acceptable business practices are no longer going to be acceptable. And so I think increasingly, whether it's you know the fact that you know certain components of Tesla batteries are still produced in post-industrial hell holes that are destroying parts of the planet that we don't know about, or in the other direction, downstream your question, which is you know, Fenix's iron ore is going to parts of the world where they're, you know, producing incredibly hideous toxic gas potentially in the atmosphere as part of their process. I think that's going to have to be identified by other parties and ultimately the short answer to my question with, you know, companies are going to be forced to take into those into account in some way. I think you summed it up really well there. I think what you've got to do is, as an organisation, you've got to take accountability Look at the processes, see where the improvements can be done, um, be innovative where you can be, um, and collaborate. Um, speak to your, you know, your opposition, talk to people out there in the industry, 
And lucky things can be, do, be done differently. Don't be lazy. Don't just say, oh, this is the way we've done it and the way we're always going to do it. You've got to look at alternatives this day and age. So, again, go back in the early stages of projects for the lifetime. Go through the all, the whole process, and see if you're doing what the best can be done. Look at different processes and see how it's going to be managed in collaboration again. Yeah. I mean, it is interesting, that question. I don't know if anyone here plays Catan, but it's a board game where you, you have to produce, you know, you have to have so many cards of sheep and wheat and ore and uh, wood uh, in order to build villages and things. And, and you know, the in other industries, there is already huge restriction on who your customer base is. If you're in Australia and you're producing, for example, drone engines, uh, you can't sell those into you know, non-friendly hands. Um, I think another way to answer the question is at the moment, if you're a, a producer of a commodity in the mining space, you're pretty much open, unless you've got an off-take partner, you're pretty much open for anyone who wants to buy that commodity. Uh, uh, whether and, and whether they're an environmentally friendly user or not is not part. It's really just a price-driven and logistics function. Uh, it would be great if if that changes and there's more there's the ability for smaller scale miners and larger scale miners to be more discerning about the downstream impacts of their product but i don't see that at the moment look i I'd probably take that from a different perspective and look we're very different to john in that we're still a you know hopefully a developer in in the next few years and then then one day a producer and so for us you know we're still very much proving up why should the community and stakeholders give us social license to develop a project? So I think for us being nickel, if we were saying, look, our export, our offtake will go to producing stainless steel in another country, I mean, that would be one business case that they'd have to consider. Uh, but alternatively, and this is the one that we're going down, is that the output from our mine will go to be producing EVs domestically. The story there is a lot stronger. And so, look, scope three summarises it in terms of emissions. But I think there is some value in controlling that narrative about how your product will be used and it can also help in terms of yeah, getting your project across the line. So something that we're definitely focusing on. I mean, that brings me kind of nicely to one of my final thoughts, which was looking at, um, you know, we a lot of the themes that we've been discussing today are about the amount of money that needs to go into the mining industry in order to kind of decarbonize the world, um, but there's a huge PR issue um, with regards to what mining means for the world and, and what metals are needed. So um, how, do you, how do you communicate these ESG factors? How do you communicate with the global citizenry? Well, um, look, I think that's already started, and, and yeah. you know, the answer is listen to, to um, people like Mitchell. You know, telling their story and 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 being involved in their own personal decision to get involved in that project and what their, their you know the team are trying to do there. I think that's inspirational um, and and you know there are there are wonderful uh, opportunities for PR. You know, going back not very long, mining. If, it, if there's a mining article in the news, in the background there's invariably one of two images. One was a big picture of a big yellow truck uh, and the other one would be a pretty fat bloke in a mining hat. You know, that, that was it. Here's, here's an article about mining. Here's a miner. Um, and I'm actually quite interested that, that miners are, are now starting to be seen as the solution to some of these problems. You know, if you look at the lithium or the electric vehicle market, which is creating lots of value and interest and, and potentially changing the global emission um, picture, you know, that requires... Suddenly people have actually connected that where all these minerals come from, particularly rare earths and other things, but even nickel and, and potentially iron ore, the, the, the mine has gone from just being the biggest problem while everyone uses all their products that come from mining without recognising that they are, um, to actually potentially being the supermen and superwomen of the future they are going to find the unobtainium that we need to solve the, the, the planet's problems. Um, and so that PR story is one that's that, that's uh, still evolving. And I think, uh, you know, as an accountant, you know, I grew up in an environment where there were endless uh, soap operas and series and rom-coms about lawyers, um, 
you know, take Suits, for example, and Megan or, you know, Matt Locke. There was no, there was no Chicago accountants or, you know, it's the most boring industry in the world and unsexy. So, you know, I, then I went into mining where we're sort of environmental criminals and, uh, you know, equally uh, uh, dirty so I'm delighted that that I hope that you're right that we've got a PR scope in front of us and miners that are going to become the supermen and superwomen of saving the planet uh, by not only being cleaner and greener in what we do but more importantly uh, providing the minerals uh, that are required to change what we've been doing over the last few decades. I tend to disagree in some regards. I think we've done a pretty terrible job advertising what we do <laughs> because if there was no mining and no oil and gas, there'd be no renewable energy industry. There just wouldn't be. You know, wind farms, solar farms, everything, you know, electric vehicles, even going down to, you know, everything that we take for granted, like mobile phones and TVs, you know, without mining and oil and gas, none of those things, we wouldn't have them. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have them. And we haven't told the world that. We should be out there pushing it a lot more. If the whole world wants us to go to electric vehicles, then mining has to increase tenfold. So you want more renewable energy? Then do more mining because it all comes from mining and oil and gas. If you don't increase them, you can't have a more renewable world. So it's a pretty much a catch-22, but it's what you've got to do if that's what you want. And I don't think we've done it well. You know, I worked in the oil and gas and mining industry in the nuclear industry my whole life. I've been at the receiving end of a lot of abuse from environmentalists and they're sticking the mobile phone in your face, threatening to stick you on YouTube and publicise who you are, but you're thinking, you do know that comes from the oil and gas industry, that phone that you're pointing at me now. So they don't get it. And they've got the plastic signs, oil and gas, you know, everything they, they want, it comes from the mining industry. I think we've got to do more to publicise the fact that we are doing a lot for the renewable energy industry. How do you do more? Or how do you communicate that better? Uh, more PR. I think, yeah. you know, we see a lot of adverts on TV at the moment that push the environmental agenda. I don't think we see as many adverts pushing what we're doing. I think we need to, the industry as a whole needs to invest more money. And I'd, I'd say I'm looking more to the tier ones than those smaller exploration companies. We don't have that kind of money. We can't spend shareholder money going out there advertising this thing. We just can't. But, you know, the big tier one companies out there who, who do have that money, they need to be out there and spending it and publicising more the great work that the mining and the oil and gas industry are doing. Big, thick so the, the question was, are the junior mining sector required to produce a sustainability report? And the short answer on the ASX is no. There's an incentive to do so, and I think no. part of the, the PR investment mm. in, in any company is actually... Uh, but a sustainability report is really driven by investors. So if you've got institutional investors on your register who, who are going to require it, then then you... Yeah, they can, they are, having done, uh, you know, one. Um, if you're going to do it properly, yes, absolutely. So we, we just completed our second. So again, we're not in production, but we just completed our second sustainability report. And look, it's a three to four month exercise. I mean, you have to survey every employee as to how they commute to work. Uh, but the, the end product is fantastic. And taking that to investors, stakeholders and saying, look, we actually care about it because we're tracking it is quite powerful. So I wouldn't be surprised in the next few years if it is a requirement. Uh, and we, we are seeing, I hope I get the terminology right, but there, there is the, the ESG 200. So there is a subset of the ASX, so where, where we're from, uh, in terms of traded securities that can claim to have better, I guess, sustainability credentials than others because they produce reports of, of this kind of nature. Uh, so we are seeing a change. Yeah, look, we report to the Queensland government, but that's it really. I mean, there's... There's other ways as well. I mean, your environmental impact statements and all that that we have to do is, again, I would say more crucial because without an approved EIS, uh, your project won't get approved. So, you know, and they're expensive to produce. Um, but it 
covers everything on your project. I mean, you asked about regu regulators. I, I think there's all, there's a couple of other market drivers, and one is debt financiers and their requirements in terms of, uh, you know, one way to look at ESG is risk mitigation. Uh, and then investors, and there are a number of investors, whether you're not just in green funds, but the broader in investment landscape that wants some level of reporting on ESG outcomes. And th those are the things that will force miners who, that are either attracting debt capital or equity capital, as well as their responsibilities to a regulator uh, to, uh, to adopt those sort of uh, disclosure investments. All right. And so... You know, what's, what's the way forward, um, either for individual companies, for the industry as a whole? Yeah. I was going to say, maybe maybe just to kind of get ahead of that, if we can ask a question of the audience perhaps in that, would you pay more for an EV that could have could support a claim that it had better ESG credentials than its competitor? Would that be something you'd pay for? Maybe a show of hands if you'd say yes. <laughs> That's a pretty strong no. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's correct. Look, I th but I think the tide is, is turning and, and maybe this being, you know, a certain jurisdiction. But that surprises me, though. 5% more if you knew that the sourcing of materials were from renewable, you know, sources of supply. Well, I think it also brings back the question of whether you'll buy an EV because it's more environmentally friendly in the first place rather than an ICE. Yeah, correct. I guess a follow-up question is about, um, let's talk about green premium. So when you talk to your buyer of your materials, have you been able to successfully negotiate like green premium um, because you're operating? Look, I'll take yeah. this one uh, because I think nickel is probably one of the, the commodities that could claim. So look, I think it's fair to say at the moment, there's not a premium. Um, but we are seeing a bifurcation. So we think there will be cutoffs in certain markets as to how many emissions are reporting to the product. Uh, one thing that is interesting, and I just picked this up a few days ago, in that, that Vale is a, is a massive uh, nickel producer, I think, you know, top four. And they do report a, a line item within their production of being nickel destined for EV production. So I, I think the market is, is warming up to the fact that it, it is a special type of nickel that will go to that, I guess, end consumer. Uh, and we just hope that in the, the near term that there'll be a price premium attached to it. Any other questions or comments from the audience? Okay, so back to my last question. What's the way forward for the industry? Look, I, I think the, the ESG way forward is to continue to focus on being more efficient. And you know, the, uh, it's wonderful if small miners are going to exist in an ecosystem that incentivizes them to be warriors for the improvement of air quality uh, and the empowerment of local communities and all of the things that miners need to be conscious of. Ultimately, though, the, you know, those, those outcomes are as equally driven by the miners' intention as they are by their investors, their debt providers, uh, the host government regulations and any other regulator that's relevant. Um, so the way forward, the industry is improving all around us. There's an increasing focus from investors on positive outcomes for the environment. That's fabulous. And I think there's a, there's a, there's a harmonious relationship between the increasing... Uh, demand for esoteric minerals and and also the efficiency of all mining extractive industries uh, and the focus on it and that's a great positive and so there's lots of um, opportunities for further improvement. Yeah look I feel like the way forward is future proofing your business. Have strong ESG policies, processes that you're going to follow and have a clear pathway forward because if you don't have a, you know, if you don't future-proof your business, you won't have a business in the future, depending on what you're doing, of course. And and if I was sitting on that side of the fence and I was sitting down there as an investor, that's what I'd be looking for. I'd be looking for an organisation that is is aware of what's happening, the change that is coming, and a company that has strong ESG policies. Yeah, similar comment from me. So look, if you leave the mining and refining companies to their own devices. Look, we're, we're profit-driven and it'll just be a, a race to the bottom for the lowest cost supplier to enter the market. But 
I think it's really incumbent on the investors, so so this group, uh, but also the customers to kind of demand the change that, that they want to build a sustainable future. So I think in events like these, you know, asking questions of the companies that you interact with in terms of how's their sustainability report, what they're doing to reduce emissions, I think these questions are gaining more prominence uh, and I think that will increase uh, in the future. All right, and that brings us to a nice uh, end of the panel. I'd like to thank our panelists for joining us today. Thanks very thank much. You.